Good morning from the hash knife. Um, I want to kind of cover a little bit of paperwork type of uh, activity and why we do what we do with our registered Tennessee walking horses. Um, we produce horses and have a, a product, as you would uh, call it, for sale for the general public. And uh, what we need to do with that product is basically prove that it's what we say it is. Is it a registered Tennessee walking horse? Well, how do we, how do we accomplish that? Uh, a number of years ago, they started using science technology. Uh, basically, everybody knows what DNA is and how it can be traced and how it can prove parentage. So we've moved that into not just uh, horses and cattle, but there's a lot of other different uh, types of markers that are used to verify or prove that someone is who they are. And uh, the, the process about that has changed over uh, the last few years. We used to basically do a needle stick and pull blood, draw blood from the horse into a couple of different vials, uh, just like you would do when you go get a, a blood test or a blood workup at your local um, healthcare provider. And you would put those in a pack and ship them off as quick as you could to a laboratory. Well, that was after you made a registration application. And in order to do that, you have to list the dam, the sire, and show their registration numbers because they've also been uh, parentage verified. And it isn't just to prove that it's a horse, it's to prove that it come from a specific set of parents. And again, to prove a genealogy or a, uh, a certain line. So you make that application, and you, on that application, you put down the phenotype. And uh, so we'll, we'll cover some of the paperwork that's involved, why they do it, what they do, and uh, then we'll go ahead and instead of a needle stick now, we'll just go pull a couple of hairs. Uh, they need about 25 to 50 uh, root hairs on an animal and you put it in an envelope and you send it off a whole lot different than it used to be uh, there were times when we would we would pull uh, samples on these horses in sometimes freezing cold weather because it was getting down to a deadline um, of the six months that the register or the breeder organization would allow to have um, you to do that now it sounds like you're procrastinating but you're not because you, Horses can change color from the time of birth to, you know, certainly within a couple of years. And uh, so this DNA kind of helps track that a little bit where you can, you still want to be as accurate as you can. You want to wait till nearly the last uh, minute or the last little bit before the six months is up to submit the uh, DNA so that you can really be accurate on the application about what the color of this animal is probably going to be. You still put in some, some things like, Mm, you know, they've got a, like a gray modifier in the case of this horse that we're going to do. Uh, when I, and when she was first foaled, I would have bet money that she would have been kind of a grayish color within six months. And right now I'm not really seeing anything. So probably wrong. And that's why this is also handy. But uh, I've seen horses also change color, you know, two to three years after foaling. So uh, some of those colors can change over time. They can darken, lighten, and uh, we'll kind of go over some of the, the application process, what registration should look like, the interim registration they send you, and then also the paperwork that we use to submit the, uh, the sample. So kind of nice. We're not going to have to do any kind of a needle stick today. I can just pull a couple of hairs and call it good. So uh, we'll go over this uh, paperwork next and then go outside. This is the registration application, and uh, it's also a request for a kit to get some DNA and prove parentage on their horse. Uh, the Breeders Association for the Tennessee Walking Horse makes this actually pretty easy. Uh, this is a downloadable form. Uh, it used to be you just had to get them sent to you, but these are now you know just right off of the computer. And you simply fill this thing out. Uh, the first thing you do is ask for whichever type of registration you want or a nomination for uh, some of their, their programs they have. And this for us, of course, is just for a parentage verification and registration. Uh, you simply check that. 
And then you have to decide what name you want to, to call this critter. Um, they give you three choices. And the reason they do that is because you may inadvertently pick a name of a, another horse that's out there. Um, we almost always, uh, I don't think we've ever not done this, and that is put the name of a ranch in front of the horse's name. So if it says hash knife something something, we know that that come from our place or someone else would know that if they're familiar with our animals. Uh, the other part of that is it almost guarantees that you're going to get the animal's name that you want. Um, for instance, this horse, uh, the first choice was filled in as Hayhook Silver Envy. Um, Hayhook is the ranch uh, my mom and dad uh, went by. And so all of their horses are still there. My mom still has a couple of horses and this being one of them. So we put in Hayhook, Silver Envy, and as a first choice, didn't even fill out the second and third choices and got the name just because the uh, rarity of Hayhook being in front of something. So you got 25 different characters, including spaces to put a name down. And sometimes these can get kind of lengthy and be quite a handle on an animal if you're not careful. Uh, the other part they want to know is everything about this horse. They want to know uh, the state that it was foaled in. Uh, they want to know the foaling date. And then the breeding date, whether this was a single uh, exposure to a stallion or if the animal was pasture bred, the mare was pasture bred to a certain stallion from and to uh, dates, say, for instance, June 1st to uh, August 15th or August 31st. They want to know those dates because that also has to uh, coincide with the stallion report that is filed by the breeder, whoever is standing a stallion uh, every year. And and I, of course, are the uh, our stallion was the one that was exposed to Silver Envy's mare. And so I had filled that report out the year before. And those, have, those dates have to match. It just is another double check that this is truly an animal that's been been uh, done there. And I think this is really a holdover uh, of how we used to do things because DNA is what's really going to determine that. This is really kind of a, um, a relic in a way uh, as far as the breeding dates. Uh, then they want to know whether this is a little stallion, uh, mare, or if this is an older horse and uh, is being registered for the first time at a later date, which will you know cost someone a lot more money in order to make that happen, but they want to know the sex of the horse. And then you come over here to one of the most important parts, and that is the phenotype. They want to know what this horse looks like so that it goes on the registration papers, uh, even though this is a DNA verification uh, type of request. So uh, you can write down none on the body markings. And for this particular little filly, uh, she is a solid black. There are no markings on her whatsoever. She is black all over. And so this is very easy. You don't have to do anything, but just mark none. But if she was to have a uh, some white on her, or this was a bay horse, or uh, meaning kind of a dark red with black legs and a uh, black mane and tail, then you would write that in. And it shows the right side or off side and then on the left side or near side of this horse. And you, you write both sides on there. And some of our friends who have uh, paint horses, they will have to draw in the pattern on that horse. Uh, for us, we don't raise the uh, paint, so it's pretty easy. Uh, we talk about main tail and the face and then the legs. And you can see here with the legs, you have what is called different... Um, descriptions of markings. So you, you can see where it says stocking there and the dotted line that goes across. If the white goes up to that, that's called a stock and legged horse. I mean, it's as simple as that. The sock, the same way, goes up to the middle of the cannon bone. And then the fetlock is about halfway between the uh, hoof and the uh, where a sock would be. And then the cornet is just above the feet or the hooves. And it really says like, R4, L3, R, L1, R2. That's the same thing that's down here. You got one left four, uh, two is a right four. And so they're marking those as right and left side and 
right and left side on this side for the hind and four legs. And then you write that description in there as well. And so that really gives you a uh, ability to describe what this horse physically looks like. Now the color, you have the entire uh, approved or recognized colors by the Breed Association. And it starts from black all the way down to bay and brown, up to buckskin, down to gold and champagne, uh, gold cream champagne. I mean, there are varying degrees of uh, some of these lighter colored horses, all the way down to white uh, at the very end. And then you have some of the modifiers, like the gray modifier or a roan, uh, and then dilutions of those, for instance, like on your buckskins, uh, dun colors, uh, some of the, the hair changes color, which actually uh, lightens, except for like the legs and mane and tail for your, your dun colored horses. On the gray modifier, that's what we're, we've uh, already checked because her uh, stallion was a gray horse. So she could at some time gray out and we want to make sure that that modifier is listed in the genetics as a possibility. And she may not, and as it turns out, I don't think she will, but you never know and in a couple of years that can happen. So then we move over to the face markings and they want you to draw on every white area and they, they are very specific about the upper lip and lower lip and the chin. And if there's a white spot and we have had just a single spot, for instance, on the chin, you draw that in where it's at and the approximate size in relation to uh, the anatomical part there. And then you can do a, a star up between its eyes and high, uh, a snip, which comes down a very thin part way, or a strip, which is all the way down uh, the entire face. You've seen that also called a blaze. And then you have to just describe those facial markings. Simple as that. It's it's uh, pretty easily done. and uh, But it gives a specific written record as to what the phenotype looks like. And then, of course, you put in the owner application signature. And if you prepared it or not or had someone else do it. And then uh, one of the important parts that also has to go on this is the sire and dam information. Now, the sire's registered name has to go in. And the registration number along with that. And then who owned that sire at the time of the uh, breeding to this mare. And the mare... Uh, or the dam, if you want to call it uh, uh, more specifically or technically, their name goes in there as well. So all they're doing is recording the parents of this um, filly or applicant horse so that they can absolutely verify through the DNA samples that, that that's who it was. Again, it's a relic, but now this one's a relevant relic. And then they ship you a verification uh, kit, which uh, used to be a blood draw. And now we don't do that, don't need to do that, because we, as technology got better and better, we simply just pull some hairs. And uh, it's kind of nice to be able to do that. It's a little bit less um, traumatic for the horse. Uh, sometimes you miss a vein, and I'll kind of show later on how I would expose a vein on a, on a horse and be able to uh, hit it maybe a little bit easier. Um, all of the information is down here uh, for the dam's owner, uh, signatures, and time of service, who owned it. Uh, they really want to track not only the animal, the animal's parents, but the owners, because that can change between um, the time that the foal hits the ground till the time uh, you're going to do the registration. So. And then, of course, a fee schedule. Nothing goes without some costs. So we'll uh, uh, put that in there or have done that. And this is what allows you to do that and uh, pay for your verification kit and the registration fee and then uh, send that off. Okay, now this is what you get back after you've made the application and everything is uh, okayed by the Breed Association. You get this temporary certificate. And what that really does is just show that the mare, which she's a filly now, but in time she will be a mare, uh, and that her name indeed was submitted and accepted. And then they gave a registration number to her. And then who the horse is owned by, 
bred by, and then the uh, uh, sex, again, the color, and any markings that were on the, on the horse that we put on the application, and of course there's none there. And then they have the full date of the mare as of uh, the end of July of this past year. Then they have the sire's registration and the sire's name and color. And then they have the horse again with the registration number, color, and then the dam, uh, who that uh, foal came out of, and then the official okie dokie seal. Now this is not a, as you can see in the watermark, it's temporary. It's not eligible for exhibiting or breeding the horse, but the horse could be sold. The one thing that we've got here is a big space that says no parentage verified. And, uh, but they still do have the ability to uh, transfer or somebody could sell this animal before the parentage is verified. And then that would come subsequent to that and will uh, show what the dam's registration is here in a moment. So this is the finished product of what you're looking for. And of course, this is not, is not hers, but this is her mother, her dam. And uh, again, it shows basically the same information that uh, this is a mare, her name, registration number, who she's owned by, and color and markings. And she's a sorrel color. As uh, if you've followed us in the, in the past with this mare and colt, and the colt being imprinted, you'll notice the colors. And you can see the full date is 2001. So this mare is coming 20 years old. She was 19 when she had her, her this this filly, and this is going to be her last colt. We won't need to won't breed her anymore. Then it shows her lineage, shows her name and registration number, and the S O stands for sorrel. And when you look at the lineage or her pedigree, it shows her sire, which is Hayhook Ace of Hearts, which is a stallion we had, his registration number and color, and then his parents. Uh, on the upper side, the top side, you've got the Pride Piper, and the bottom side, you've got Absorca Rosebud, and of course, uh, CH is Chestnut, and SO is Sorrel, then their parents, and then their parents. And you'll see here, uh, Midnight Sun was a world grand champion. That's what that WGC means. And uh, was one of the uh, early horses in the breed registry. And then you've got a bunch of, I see the, his, he sired Pride of Midnight HF. And you'll see as we come down here on the bottom side, you'll see, there he is, Pride of Midnight HF again. So some of these do have some, some line breeding way far enough way in back in the registration that is not uh, harmful uh, and you want to be careful of that and that's part of also the reason why you pay attention to your uh, genetics as they are basically represented on the registration so here you've got again all of these all of these horses in this animal's past and how they look what they uh, had as a registration number, who they're related to, and uh, also when when they fold. For instance, uh, say this pride's black shadow. The first three or first two numbers in that registration is the year that he fold. And if you go up here to Midnight Sun, he was in fold in 1941. So that was two years after the breed registry started as an official registry. And these horses have been around since. Um, basically, we were in the colonies, uh, pre-revolutionary war days. So that's the front side of the registration that you're looking for. And the back side then shows, very similarly to the temporary registration, we have a color code key and the genetics. Instead of no parentage verified like the temporary had, we do have the parentage verified on this one. And you can see the name again, uh, the sire, the dam, and uh, the date that it was tested, her registration number, and they even have at the very top left there uh, in the blood type information, the case number. So they go down to what lab work was even done on this. And then you have uh, some of the uh, allele information on your genetics, on your DNA. 
And then it says as a analysis that the indicated sire and dam qualify. And what that means is that they verified that those are indeed the parents. And then this was a blood type done by the University of Kentucky uh, through their labs. And there's different labs that do this. But now we're, again, all in with uh, a lot easier way to do it through hair samples. Uh, they're much, much more stable uh, through the mail. So you don't have to worry about that. And then again, you've got this uh, uh, portion of it where you can transfer the register uh, a certificate of registration and the horse upon sale. And of course, my mother has so, uh, already signed this. Uh, in case she's not around, I can do it for her. And that's really what we're looking for as a final product. And we'll go outside here in a moment and we'll grab this little filly and I'll uh, show you what we used to do, how we used to get that uh, blood sample. And now it is really much easier with the hair pull. Here's our little filly. And uh, as you can see, she's got no white on her at all. And a lot of times the white will show up here, say in a flank or around their muzzle a little bit. And she's got nothing at all that's going to indicate that she's going to turn gray at this point. But we're going to put the modifier down on the application or did because her sire was a gray. And so she could uh, eventually gray out in some spots or kind of half gray. And one of the things I want to show you is what we used to do is come right here into this groove and you can see if I can push this, oh, just kind of occlude this jugular a little bit and you'll see how that opens up and reduces when I let the blood go. So we used to, good girl, hold on sweetheart. We used to just come up here with a needle, hold that, open that up and then stick it and uh, be able to fill. So a little more traumatic that way. Uh, we don't have to do that anymore. And uh, it's not a big deal, but um, it sure makes it a lot more mechanically harder to pull that hair when it's a little bit uh, <laughs> wiggly with a, a young colt not wanting to cooperate too much. There we go. And she's, she's a good girl. You can see if you've been watching us at all on her uh, imprinting, then it's uh, kind of nothing new, uh, different than what we've been doing. I just want to grab a bunch of, of uh, turns on a stick here. Any old generic stick, didn't have to buy this anywhere. And uh, do that so that it basically doesn't break the hairs. And I missed, so I'm going to have to get this a little bit better, but that's our, our goal. Try this one more time here. Good girl. That kind of didn't feel good. What the heck? What are you doing to me? Why? Do you know who I am? Do you know where I came from? Do you know how important I am to my mother who has abandoned me? <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to have to give a little bit of a reassurance here. I can. Let's see if we can get this get this done. And again, pardon the fingers in the camera. I've got I need a couple more or somebody else here holding the camera, but that's not an option today. So we just kind of wrap that around best we can. And her hair is so soft and so down-like that it's very difficult. There we go. I'm just going to kind of let her move off. It's all right. And show you what we have is a number, if you can see them, 25 to 50 hairs. And trust me, it's hard to see it in here, but the, the root bulbs are there. So we'll throw that on the the paper and send it off into the mail. We should be seeing a registration back with her DNA in no oh, couple of months anyway. All right. I hope this was helpful, educational, and as, uh, as always, it was fun for us to kind of let you know what we do. Thanks a lot.